When you founded your company, uh, well, first Random House, then your own company, Public Affairs, you cited three mentors. You've already named one of them, but I'd like to go back to the first one, a legendary figure, I.F. Stone. You worked for him as an assistant when you were a very young man. How did that come about? And what, act, what was the essence of what he taught you? Well, uh, I hope everybody watching this knows who I have Stone is, so I don't have to really introduce him. But as he was in the 60s and early 70s, he was what today would be called, I don't know what he called, blogger or substack. He had his own weekly. And the reason he had his own weekly is because in the McCarthy era, he was branded a leftist. He couldn't get a job. So he started his own. And by the time I went to work for him, it was really established. I like to say that his first subscriber in 1953, among his first subscribers in 1953 was Albert Einstein. And later, Marilyn Monroe bought subscriptions for every member of Congress. But by the time I was working there, he had about 70,000 subscribers. He was a very important voice in the anti-war pro-civil rights movement. But what was significant about him is that he was left wing in the sense that that was his worldview, been to Moscow and said, I don't like these people, but he was not an anti-communist apostate. He remained what was called in the 60s kind of new left. And he always had an assistant and I was the assistant for one publication a year, which was September to July. And uh, you know, my job was to be running around and helping him. And he gave me some bylines, which was really unusual for Izzy. Um, and we became really good friends afterwards. I mean, friends. When he died, his family asked me to organize the memorial service. So what was it about Izzy? Brilliant reporter. But what he taught me, I guess, and what he taught all the other people was, you know, Believe in what you're doing. Don't do it just for the money because that's not the answer. And do it with a voice. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's yeah. you don't have to be shrill to be persuasive. And you can find a lot of material in the congressional record and other public documents. Right. Now, I mean, Izzy had an incredible memory. He could remember if he saw an item in a newspaper uh, in June. And he wanted to know what it, and he would say, listen, can you get the item from June and match it with the item from December? Yeah, <laughs> and it yeah, was my yeah. job to get the two yeah. items and put them together. Yeah. It's a wonderful documentary, by the way, which is easily available to anybody now on YouTube. It's called I Have Stones Weekly. And when it came out in 1973, Vincent Canby chose it as one of the 10 best films of the year. It's mm -hmm. a little 65 minute black and white documentary, but everything you want to know about Izzy is in that film including a very, very, very young me. Yeah, right. Well, did any of his anti-war fervor rub off on you when you were actually found yourself in Vietnam? Were you an well, opponent of the war? That, that's, that goes to the Bradley question. You, know, you, you said the three mentors. Right. I, meant, mentioned I was that. about, I was about to ask you about Bradley. Then Bob and his BBS, right? But the amazing thing is, as I reflected on it, that when Ben Bradley called me into his office, I was 26. And he didn't say, you know, you're doing a good job. And he didn't say you're a fine fellow. And he didn't say, what are your politics? He knew I worked for Izzy. He just said, will you go to Vietnam? And I said, of course. Because his standard was, if you go, will you do everything you can to cover the story to our and to the reader's satisfaction? That was his standard. Now, whether that would be the standard today, I don't know. He, he didn't say, well, let's see now, Peter, what is your draft status? Or let's see, Peter, you know, what, have you ever joined a demonstration? He didn't ask any of those questions. And maybe he, you know, he could have, he didn't. All if, he, knew if he was, had, what would, if he had said, had you ever been to a demonstration? Well, what I, would you have answered? No. The answer would have been no. So no, you were not heard. part of a... You didn't feel yourself part of that kind of that, that groundswell in the late 60s um, that was very critical of the war and began sort of anti-establishment, uh, you know, feelings spreading throughout universities and things. Well, John, I was a little older than that. Remember, I graduated from college. I was a product of the John Kennedy years. Right. I started college in 60 and finished in 64. 
And, you know, curiously, those were a, a kind of a, I mean, they, they were misleading. They were the Peace Corps. They were the early civil rights demonstration. You know, the only demonstration I ever participated in was a civil rights demonstration in Atlantic City. At, I was there as a volunteer at the Democratic Convention in 64. But I'd been to Mississippi and I'd met Fannie Lou Hamer and I met all those folks down there. And when they were not being seated as the Mississippi delegation in the Democratic Convention in 1964, in my little tie and jacket, I went out and stood on the boardwalk next to Stokely Carmichael and shook Martin Luther King's hand. And that was the only demonstration I ever participated in. I was a reporter and I just somehow knew that a reporter doesn't, but right. I don't know whether that would be appropriate today. Whether right. Brad, if he called me in today, would have said, well, Peter, you know, we need to know. Uh -huh. It just wouldn't occur to him. It just wasn't his thing. Right. right. What you do as a reporter, and if you got it right, he was definitely on your side, which is one of the reasons why he was such a successful editor. Yeah, yeah.